the the graphics and the you know costume, the apparel, the the the, the language. It's just 62, so nice 62. You know, I mean, it's this this moment in time, and I think that's one of the things that's so great about this fair is it happened at sort of America's last hopeful moment for a long, long time. Um, the Cuban Missile Crisis was announced the day after the fair closed. So, you know, this was sort of the, the, the last hurrah. We can see that, but none of them knew it. You know, there's this innocence about it all. I find it really intriguing. When Paul and I got our start researching this, we began uh, 2010, I think. No, 2009. 2009. That's right. No, oh, because we had written, um, a co written a history of the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition. And if you were here in 2009, you know that the city celebrated that in a big way. And there were signs on the sides of the buses and lots of conferences. And folk life was devoted to it. And we had a fantastic time um, talking about our book that whole summer long. And what was fun about it, the, 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 the switch over was we had spent three to four years on that book putting that together and that was it was a tougher book to write because it was it was so long ago it was a hundred years ago there's nobody to interview You'd, we'd have to dig around the records were scattered to the there are very winds. few records for there that fair records. um so if you think about an, a company like your company if if uh, nobody saved the records of your day-to-day -day existence there'd be nothing in a hundred years for people to look at except maybe when you it was reported in the newspaper and that's kind of the situation with the ayp so we spent you know as i said about three years burying ourselves in 1909 Seattle, looking through 1909 newspapers, all very Edwardian, you know, we, we're talking about women in corsets and men in top hats, very elegant and refined. So we finished that book, and then all of a sudden, zoom, we fast forward 50 years, and now we're talking about astronauts, we're talking about Elvis, we're talking about nuclear war, all right. these things. It was a complete culture shock, we, culture we change. We literally got, um, got the contract to work on this book in the last two weeks of celebrating the 1909 fair. And there was so much material for this fair and so many people still alive to talk to about it. And uh, of course, it was amply reported in all of the Seattle newspapers. We just had to pivot. And I thought of it at the time because I was really steeped in, you know, corsets and the big hats and the black and white gorgeous big pictures. And it was like, er, from the corset to the panty girdle, just <laughs> complete pivot, you know, the, the fashion and everything. And it was jarring. You just see jarring. women's legs for like three months. I was like, oh, oh, their dresses are so short. But, but the <laughs> one nice thing was, is, you know, as I mentioned for the 1909 fair, there was nobody around to talk to who went to that fair. And right from the start with this fair all of a sudden now we had people to interview and people who worked at the fair who were actually in positions of, of authority and this was one of the, f the very first things that really surprised us was we got a list of you know of people who should we talk to we you know talked to people at the Seattle Center and people who worked at the fair and they said oh talk to this person they said talk to that person and we look at this list and there's so many people on there that were in positions of importance so what that tells you is is that's 50 years ago now is how young these people were that worked on this fair, uh, that you know that were that had these positions of of, of power and, and were able to do important things. They're still around, right? And we realized immediately because when we were working on the AYP book, we thought, oh, that there will have been a 50th anniversary celebration. Lots of people will have told their stories. There'll be oral histories. There'll be you know letters and. Mm -hmm. Diaries and and what we found was that uh, in 1959, the 50th anniversary of the AYP, Seattle was not looking back yeah. to celebrate. They were looking ahead and planning this fair, and so that kind of memory that existed then didn't get captured. So as we're working on this, we're thinking, you know, about telling the story, but we're also thinking somebody's going to write a 75th anniversary book about and this fair, and somebody's going to write a hundredth, and everything that we're able to collect and put down, put in the book, put on. History Link, make sure it ends up in an archive, encourage some of these people who have amazing materials in their attics to get them into an archive, you know, the, the more we are serving history. So that's been a really important part of that. It was. And uh, so we started digging into the fair, um, not just the fair itself, but the planning part of it. And, and this is where we discovered, we kind of knew this already, <coughs> but the interesting aspect of this fair is that 
this fair was planned with to leave something in its wake, to leave a legacy. World's fairs don't normally do that. Usually when you have a World's Fair, you build up, you have all these great buildings, the fair comes to town, people come visit, then when the fair's over, those buildings are torn down, that's it, finito, you know, but not in the case of, of Seattle's fair. Yeah, it's interesting because that same thing was true of the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition. Weirdly enough, um, the, <coughs> the uh, Board of Regents for UW had been trying for years to get money from the state to build some permanent buildings because they had only five permanent buildings. And so they ended up being able to do that, make fair buildings that were built to be permanent, and they had those after the fair. So already that's unusual in terms of world's fairs. And for this fair, the fact that a Civic Center Planning Commission and a World's Fair Planning Commission came together and realized that they could leave a permanent legacy, they could you know, have money to build buildings that weren't just meant to last a few months, and the city would have that you know, for, for a long, long time. It's an interesting thing about Seattle's way of thinking, and yeah, maybe it's just because we've written two books about Seattle fairs, but I think, well, what's wrong with everybody else? You know, why didn't Chicago do that, and what about New York? And the, you know, yeah. it's unique. That the, 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 a lot of the fair officials joked afterwards. They said the, uh, the underlying goal of this fair was, they, they, they joked and said, this was a civic center disguised as a world's fair. Right. They sold it that way at That's the time. That's how they sold to, you know. to the public. They said, you know, yeah, we'll have a fair. It'll be fun. It'll be people in town. They'll spend their money. And then when they leave, we've got something there. And look, we've got the Space Needle. We've got the Pacific Science Center. We've got the International Fountain. We've got uh, the and performing the, arts, places right. for the performing arts. The Playhouse, the, the Opera House. The Playhouse, the, the, the Coliseum. All these things are, 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 are remnants of the fair that are still in use to this day. Yeah, it's interesting, you know. I think um, a lot of the people who plan this fair talked a lot about not wanting to put that kind of time and money, people's money, into it if it wasn't going to leave something for the city. So yeah. they got that. Now, another f fun part of the planning of the fair, of course, you know, you have to take your little time machine, go back to the 1950s era Seattle. This was not a well-known city at that time. This was not what we know today with, with Microsoft and you know all these other businesses that come here. Back in the 50s, now not a lot of people have heard of this. So, so they had to pitch this to not only the Bureau of International Expositions, which is, gives you the, the authority to call yourselves an official World's Fair, but in order to invite other country, countries here, they have to tell them, you know, where is Seattle? They had a hard time doing that. They had not heard of Seattle before. Yeah, they, um, this is a sort of um, funny story, but they actually had to teach people in foreign countries how to pronounce the word Seattle. It was Seattle, not Seattle, because when you see it written down, you know, you might and think it was Seattle. They actually made up these little cards that they would give to people explaining where Seattle was, how to pronounce it, little factoids about it. And then there was a map on there showing the distance from Washington, D.C., because they found out early on when they were telling people about this overseas, you know, they'd say, oh, yeah, we want to build this, this Space Needle. And people would say, well, you know, you're, you're in Washington. Why would you want to build this, the Space Needle when you have the Washington Monument right there? And so they had no clue the separations of the Washingtons. And so this was, this was a tough a tough thing for them and to sell. I think now, you know, when we, we are, we're in the really big middle of starting to celebrate this fair, um, what doesn't get talked about a lot is that it wasn't a sure thing, you know, it, it, it wasn't. It, were the people who worked for the fair early on uh, didn't sleep much at night. Uh, yeah. Some of them had moved from other parts of the country, some with families, and, you know, had really... Um, put their their everything into making this work but it, it was dodgy um, right up until the close to the very end well and even even the day it opened they were they were still freaking out about it because the, the, they had the opening ceremonies it went great it was a lot of fun and a lot of the officials went up to the space needle to just to sort of see the parking lots you know see it and they looked and the parking lots were half empty and they freaked out they thought oh my gosh this fair is going to be a dud they were so worried about that as it turns out, what had happened was so many people decided not to come opening day, fearing that there would be big crowds there. So they all came in successive days, and then you know the fair did become a hit, mm -hmm. did make money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Paul and I have been giving a lot of presentations on, on a slideshow presentation of the fair, and it's been fun because every time we give a talk, there's usually somebody in the audience that steps forward with some really interesting. Oh yeah 
you know, fair story, you know, something that happened to them there or something that they, they have. Well, one guy that showed up, that, you know, that song that you heard at the end, the, the Summer of 62 song? We gave a talk over in uh, Bellevue, I believe Yeah, it was. that was in Bellevue. And there was a, a man in, in there who, he happened to be in the library just with his daughter, and he heard, overheard in the speaker there was going to be this talk. So he came in to watch, and at the end he told us, he, he said, yeah, he says, he says my, my, what was it, his mother sang with the band. Yeah. And that song was written for her. And it was dedicated dedic to him. Dedicated to him, and he sang it for us. And this guy just ha just stumbled on our talk. And there was, was another time that, um, you know, the bubbleator, the pl big bubble plexiglass elevator. So the bubbleator operator had a speaking role in this, and it was, you know, he had a speech that you listened to <coughs> as you went up into the cloud of cubes. So one time we were doing our show, and uh, this man at the end said, I was a bubbleator operator, and we were like, oh, that was like and Elvis, you know, and he stood up and he said the whole, the whole spiel. spiel. Yeah, it was, it was really a, something. And it was a really, it, it, you know, we've actually seen the script for it. We found the script in our research, and it's it's so over the top. It's really funny. <laughs> they they talk about, you know, when people are coming aboard, he says, everybody step to the rear of the sphere, you know, which was funny because people are trying to figure out what the actual rear of a sphere is. <laughs> and then uh, he, then they, they would talk about, uh, you know, we, this this uh, the bubble later could fit a century of people. A hundred people can fit on board. And then he would do this whole rattle on about the future and what to expect. And then and then it would rise up into this exhibit. This was in the Coliseum. And, um, and as he'd tell people, you know, when the doors would be said, step off into the future. We all have to go there sometime. And this guy did the speech with those same intonations and everything. I'd still had it memorized 50 years later. Although I have to say that, um, so the, the exhibit that we curated from Ojai, which was a fantastic experience, and it's a great exhibit and it's free, so go see it sometime um, before October 21st. Um, they have a loop running that's actually the bubbleator operator's speech. And we were in there the other day making sure that all of the labels were right. And so we heard it, I don't know, maybe 40 times. <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, no wonder that guy remembered it. <laughs> I think I'll never forget it now. <laughs> um, oh, what, another person who showed up. Um, who's seen the Elvis Presley movie? Okay. So the little girl yeah. who uh, he goes through the fair with, Vicky Tu was the actress's name. She became the first lady of Hawaii. Some up. people know when she grew up. But um, So this woman came up to us, and she was kind of this short woman, and she said, I was Vicky Tu's stand-in. <laughs> it's like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> they walk among us, you know. I mean, but it's great because it's yeah. there are so many people in this community who have all kinds of large and small ties to the fair. Yeah. And uh, there was a stage full of orchestral music, and a gentleman came down with a couple of the guys to the uh, stage, and they were. I knew I knew who he was, and I I, I said, uh, "Are you Mr. Mancini?" It was Henry Mancini, and I said, "Would you play Moon River for us?" And he said yes, and sat down at the piano, and for wow. the two people he was with, and the three people I was with, and me, he played Moon River. Oh, oh, that's a wonderful I story. I saw Marie Chevalier sing Thank Heaven for Little Girls uh -huh. in front of the French Pavilion. <laughs> wow. Um, the, the story that I, that I thought was really, really funny, if I could tell it, was that besides our electric cabs, there were these long orange trains that would go around giving tours. Mm -hmm. And they would always leave the keys in the transmission. And some guy grabbed one of those while the operator was gone, took it out the exit across Mercer, <laughs> with a with a full crowd of people in it said so we've got a problem oh we've got a problem stay in the stay in the train i'm going to go over to our main base and and fix this thing so half the people got off and the gullible people stayed on. <laughs> he got it halfway across Mercer, killed the engine, said there was a problem, told them they couldn't get out of the train because it would cause problems, they might get hurt. I'll be right back and took off. Oh, with my the keys. word. And that was like at 4 o'clock when Mercer was <laughs> a one-way, two-way street, and it clogged up traffic for about three hours because they couldn't find keys to operate. Oh, the no. The ah. first real Mercer mess, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it, was a, it was a great experience. Cause oh, man. That's great. And, you know, there were 
thousands of people who worked on the fairgrounds during during yeah. the fair. Um, There's actually going to the Seattle Center's having an employer reunion at the end of May. Ju actually. No, it's June, June the 30th. June the 30th, yeah. And anyone who worked on the fair in any capacity whatsoever, uh, they want you there, and there's information on the Seattle Center website. Yeah, the website so yeah. The, the other person that I met that was kind of interesting, I was telling him, and I, I was up on top of the Space Needle, and some lady, you were talking about people not knowing where the state of Washington Saddle was. A lady asked, I heard a lady ask another guy when she looked at Washington Football Husky Stadium and said, is that Grand Coulee Dam? Oh. <laughs> but I, I, I took a Liberace on a guided tour, uh -huh. and uh, he wanted to go down to the adult section because Marty Croft, who did the puppet show, yes. yeah. had been with uh, Liberace in Vegas. And Marty Croft's girlfriend was Krista Speck, who was 1962 Playboy Playmate of the Year and the first number one Playboy Playmate of the first decade of Playboy. I actually, I actually, when during the research, I bought a copy of that off eBay for, <laughs> for, for research purposes. For research purposes only. <laughs> See, he was buying Playboy, and I was just listening to Moon River over and over <laughs> again. <laughs> you know, I, I should uh, to follow up. I, I should point out when he mentioned Sid Ma or Marty Croft. Um, that's actually another little interesting aspect of the fair on Show Street, which was the adult section you saw on there. Um, one of the shows on there was Le Poupe de Paris, and what that was, it was a uh, it was a nude marionette show, and it was produced by <laughs> Sid and Marty Croft. If, if you if you know. 70s era children's television. They produced H.R. Puffin stuff and Land of the Lost, all the those kind right. of shows. You know, they they were the ones that made those shows. Well, in the, at the fair, their show was this naked puppet show, and <laughs> we have we have not. Well, there's only one little clip that we've seen, and, and and but we still can't figure out how this was accomplished. I mean, these these marionettes would take <laughs> off their clothes and be topless and. Some of them weren't wearing much to begin with. Yeah. Like we've seen still pictures. Gauze, and yeah. Think sort of I dream of genie, but yeah. wooden kind of. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that was a, so yeah, Sid and Marty Croft were there. So. Yeah, and you know, so there's a lot of stuff that's politically incorrect, right, about the fair and about that time for sure. But um, these kinds of. Show Street uh, adult areas were common to World's yeah, Fairs. Yeah. AYP had Little Egypt uh, and some, you know, dancing girls from Cairo. Oh, about the one in um, San Francisco. San Francisco in 1939 uh, had, you know who Sally Rand was? She was a famous fan dancer. She was naked, but she would cover herself with fans and uncover and then cover really fast. So she had uh, the concession at the San Francisco 3940 Fair called Sally Rand's Nude Ranch. And this was naked women on burrows uh, <laughs> riding around. Yeah, and I, since this is going to be broadcast, I won't tell you uh, what the, the barker outside was asking people to do, but <laughs> you might be able to guess they were saying, yeah. come see Sally Rand's burrow. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so that's shocking, right? Um, uh, Gypsy Rose Lee performed at the 3940 yeah. New York Fair. Um, and so at the Seattle Fair, there were, there were different levels of let's say class to these shows now like gracie hansen's show um that was more like a you know something you could see in las vegas a lock las vegas style review nothing really that you know grotesque about it but there were some other shows that were a little sketchier there was one called girls of the galaxy Right, the Girls of the Galaxy. I think we saw a few uh, clips of it in there. The women who were parading around, one of them had kind of a moon, a crescent moon had dress on. Um, the idea was that you were supposed to bring your camera, and if you didn't have a camera with you, you could rent one, so not to worry. And these women were wearing sort of space age, space girl outfits, topless, but space girl bottoms, whatever <laughs> that was. Um, and they would pose, and they were supposed to hold the pose for three minutes, and then they could shift to a different pose. Um, and that was fine. The Seattle Board of Censors okayed that. <laughs> I've read the minutes, and it's like, yes, it's okay. They pose, and they hold it, and then they shift. Um, but unfortunately, once the censors uh, were away, they tended not to really hold the pose. In fact, shimmy was the word the newspaper <laughs> uh, used. And so they kept getting shut down by the Board of Censors, and then there were, you know, all of this very publicized because uh, the amount of ink that was spilled over Show Street and Belgian waffles yeah. uh, at the fair was was enormous. But and the Belgian 
Belgian waffles. Boy, that was the big runaway food hit of the fair. The Belgian waffles were introduced at the Brussels World's Fair, hence Belgian waffles. Um, they were a little different than a normal waffle. They were made with yeast, so they had, there was a different texture to them. Um, they started selling them here, and from day one, it was the hit of the fair. Everybody had to have a Belgian waffle. They kept up coming back for more and more and more. They ended up selling about half a million of them during the fair's run. And, and, and it was funny because everybody we talked to when we were doing the interviews, everybody mentioned, oh, yeah, the Belgian waffles. You know, they, you can almost see them start drooling There's, and thinking about So this slideshow that we do, we have a lot of, of, of images that are also in the book, and they're three always get the exact same reaction. When we put up Belgian waffles, people always go, oh. Uh, <laughs> we put up the bubbleator, they go, oh. Yeah. And then we, when we put up uh, Richard Nixon, they go, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, doesn't matter if we're in Kent yeah. or you know yeah. Everett. The reaction is the same. Yeah, the wa- but yeah, the waffles were a hit, and then you know, plus you know, as far as food at the fair, it's interesting to, to think about how there were a lot of foods that were introduced there, ethnic foods that were considered exotic at the time, like pizza. Uh, you know, th- that was uh, new for a lot of people. Mexican food, uh, but it gave you know gave ch- people here a chance to taste new food items. Yeah. It's one of those funny <coughs> things. There are a lot of links between the two fairs, many, many links between the two fairs. One of them was this idea of having a baby of the fair. So at the AYP, there was a prettiest baby contest, and the winner uh, by the time the uh, Century 21 rolled around, of course, was 50 years old, 51. And the, a, the baby for Century 21 did uh, appear at the fair and pose in the arms of the AYP Lady, uh, And then when Jamie, the uh, Century 21 baby, turned 21, she and her family were uh, given dinner at the Space Needle. So, um, and I don't know if she's still around yeah, or not. Uh, we, yeah. You know, we're always hoping people will come up to us and say, I'm that woman in the picture in the bathing suit with yeah. the ass on me. There's certain <laughs> people I, we, we would, we're really hoping they'd step forward. Like, for example, um, there was a, a young girl, um, she was the daughter of one of the people who worked in the press building, who went on a couple dates with Elvis when he was here, uh, much to the dismay of her then boyfriend. I mean, what, a, what a burn. How do you, you know, for that guy, you know, it's like. He broke yeah, my, up with her. Yeah, my, yeah, he broke up with her. How do you top that? <laughs> but, uh, you know, we, we keep hoping when we give these talks that, that she'll step forward. Now, one person we did have that contact with us that we were so thrilled about. Oh, yeah. When we were doing the research. Of course, every millionth uh, uh, person through the gates, they they made a big deal out of. They had, you know, they were they were counting, you know, people that come in, and as each million would come, they'd have a big thing where they they'd give them a big big sign. I'm the two millionth visitor to the fair, and they'd win a stuffed animal or a box of cigars. Oh, they or they dumped you know, all kinds of great stuff. Yeah, on all them. The stuff on her. Well, when we you know we we wanted to note all of these in the book, and it was fun when we were doing the research because when I when I found it was the the nine millionth girl. Her name was Paula, just like Paula. And I said, hey, guess what? The nine month girl was named Paula. So we, it she kind of became this like running thing, like, oh, little Paula. Little Paula. We kept know. talking about little Paula, you know, because like, there's a picture of her. She's really sweet. We found a photo of her. And she's six years old, and she's got this just dumbstruck look on her face. She has no idea what's happening, you know. Mm-hmm. And then she you know, walks to the gates, and all of a sudden, people are showering her with gifts. Well, once the book came out and started getting some, pl- some publicity, Little Paula contacted us. She's a teacher out in Issaquah now, and she just was so thrilled, you know, that, that she, you know, here she is again being noted, you know, her picture's in the book. So we thought it'd be fun. We, we said, well, you know, she's a teacher. She's, we said, well, what grade do you teach? She said, sixth grade. So we said, tell you what, why don't we come over and give a slideshow presentation for your students? So we did that, what, about a month ago? Right. We left out the show street part. We, yeah. like, we cleaned up the slideshow a little yeah, bit. Yeah, we just talked you know, from, think about it from, a, from like an 11-year-old perspective. You know, what would they enjoy seeing? And we added a lot of explanation, like, you know, what, it, what an area code was, <laughs> yeah. you know, and things like that that are, come into this fair story that they yeah. were like, huh? But anyway, it was so much fun, you know, meeting her and meeting her students. And uh, so that was one person we did meet, you know, that was mentioned in the book. Uh, and, you know, there are many more. There's yeah. just certain people that you read about, you go, wow, what happened to that person? Everybody seems yeah. to talk about the Belgian waffles, but 
rarely do people mention the fact that the Danish apple skivers were yeah, a real right. head that's right. right. Real yeah. headline. That's right. A couple of the fair um, executives that we've interviewed have talked about those. So yeah, they were just great. I bought an apple skiver pan and found a recipe so I could do it myself, and they're easy to do. Okay, so what do they taste like? Tell us, tell us what they what they taste they're li like. They're like a little round muffin that is baked in this, this cast iron pan with a little round yeah. holes in it, and you have oil in the bottom, and you. You put your batter in, and then it, when it browns up on the bottom, you turn them over with something, any kind of a stick or fork, and then brown them on the other side, and then you serve them. You put powdered sugar on them and serve them with applesauce. And that's yeah. all there is. It's so that's simple. great. Yum. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. But my grandfather, who was in his very early 90s, had gone to the AYP, and he lived up in northeastern Washington, and he wanted to come to the fair. So my uh, aunt and uncle put him on a bus and sent him to Seattle, and I knew he was coming in at 6.30, so I got to the bus depot a good half hour early, so I'd be sure and be there. And I was standing in line to ask the guy at the ticket counter what time the Spokane bus was coming in, and this little old man tugs at my shoulder and says, uh, I beg your pardon, but aren't you my granddaughter? <laughs> oh, sweet. <laughs> That's then so I took sweet. him to the fair, and he was enchanted by all of the mechanical things were there. Yeah. But at lunch, yeah. what do you feed a guy who has no teeth, whatever, and he's in his <laughs> 90s? But I found a spaghetti plate and <laughs> sat him down with a spaghetti plate, and he was, he was thrilled, absolutely thrilled. That's you know, great. When we were doing the research, you know, since we had just written the AYP book that was very prominent in our minds, and our, our, we, our eyes tended to zero in on newspaper articles about people who came to the fair who were also at AYP. Because, and you think about it, there was actually quite a few because, I mean, here we are today. We're 50 years away from the Century 21. There's a lot of people here that went to that fair. So now place yourself in 1962. You're the same distance away from the AYP. And so there were a lot of people that, that you know, went to the AYP that came to Century 21. Although the world was so different, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, last, the last American World's Fair before the 1962 fair was, were those 3940 fairs, the one in New York and the one in San Francisco. And th the world had gone through a lot yeah. <laughs> between uh, the two, those two world's fairs. Two, world, uh, two world's wars. Uh, uh, the, the bomb. The, bomb, the, the yeah. depression. Uh, there was a lot of changes between 1909 and 1960. Yeah, and 1909 even more so. Yeah, and you know, think about 1909. You know, the 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 just think of flight. I mean, you know, the, the Wright brothers. Uh, you know, were, that's the era of the Wright brothers. And at at AYP, the big deal was was they had a, a dirigible. You know, that floated around. Mm -hmm. Here we are at 1962 fair, and John Glenn's space capsule is on display. Right. Yeah, when you think about what's been in the air for both those, yeah. they're they're just you can really spin out in a lot of different directions on uh, on on those eras. My bluebird group um, wrapped a maypole. We did the maypole dance. Oh yeah. yeah, yes, at the flag pavilion. Your right. girl, your Girl thing. Scout. Yeah, did you say your Girl Scout troop or Blue, bluebirds? Oh, bluebirds. your bluebirds. Okay, yeah. campfire. So I know I know the difference. Memories of. Um, all the different songs that we sang while we wrapped it. Oklahoma was one of them. I remember uh, it's never left my oh, head. Oh, that's great. <laughs> that's, that's great. All. Yeah, it was, it was wonderful. Yeah, yeah the, the Flag Pavilion was where a lot of the, those kind of outdoor gathering events were like anytime high school choirs would come from other states. It'd be in the it was flag the, plaza. It was, the, it was the plaza of the states, is what it was called. Each of the flagpoles, it was a different uh, flag of the states. Right, yeah. And there were a lot of, a lot of uh, I'm sure, a lot of kids you know, that have memories of being at the, performing at the fair. There were a lot of people who ended up moving to Seattle uh, later who either came to Seattle during the fair because their high school from Nebraska needed the choir to sing, and they came on a bus. And like, so many people that we've run into have said, there was something about the fair that you know made me decide that I wanted to live in Seattle. So one of the things we get asked a lot was, how did the fair change Seattle? And that's a really complicated question, but one of the things was it put the idea of this place that sounded pretty good in the advertising and in the reports into a lot of people's heads, and many of them subsequently moved yeah, here. Yeah, that's right. You know, it's interesting, too, when you think back, again, that 50 years difference, a lot of people's memories of the fairs are childhood memories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which which makes them more magical. I think that's why the fair, you know, we're now 50 years away, you know, a lot of the stories you hear are from people that were 10 or 11 or 6 or 15, mm -hmm. and they have a much different perspective 
uh, you know, of, of the fair because they saw it from a, from a child's view. And the same thing with um, young adults, teen, older teenagers, young adults who worked at the fair. Yeah. You know, such camaraderie, and uh, there are certain things that come up again and again. For example, a lot of them hung out at the Spanish Village after they got yeah. off of work. I don't know if you ever went to the Spanish Village, but. Um, yeah. The the well, I've had a lot of uh, women who worked at the fair in their ni uh, nineteen and twenty say, "Oh, those waiters in the Spanish Village, they were so <laughs> handsome." <laughs> now, the one aspect of, of teen life at the fair, though, that that I found interesting, what we both found interesting, is it, this was not a rock and roll fair. Right. Uh, you know, I'm sure Elvis was there filming the movie, but if you look at like the me, you know, this is where this is the, the the summer of the twist. You know, the twist was popular that summer, and so rock and roll had been around for a while, and uh, you know, it was it, it was kind of a, a lull spot. It was kind of between the Elvis peak and the Beatles that came later, but still, it was a rock and roll era, and boy, you don't see a lot of that at the fair. You know, because uh, this was older guys running it, and they were probably thought, oh, this is not not our cup of tea. But there were some events around the city at that at the time there was a twist contest that was held chubby check was there yeah. the night before the fair opened it's interesting to Downtown. think how different some of that could have been if they had had sort of a youth program or something yeah. like that you know uh, that that would it would have been a different fair in a lot of ways yeah well what was that letter remember when we found that one letter that was written oh. from some teen magazine you know some and they, they you know and they were, they were the response was kind of like yeah you know it's not not really yeah. nothing for you you yeah. know there were teen things going on outside the fairgrounds, but on the fair itself. Um, they had twist parties for a while, but they got yeah. too rowdy, so they shut them down. They yeah. changed the music to, I think, polka or something. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about <laughs> wanting to lose your, your audience. Yeah. You know, those now, there, was, there, was, teens there was a little bit of, a of folk music at the fair. Joan well, Baez played Baez. there, Theater Bacall. There was some of that. Right, right. But there you, di you didn't see rock and roll at the fair. It was uh, just not there. What has really become of World Fairs in general? I don't know, Shanghai's having one? Or? They, they well, Shanghai, they that just have the one. one. They're taking bids right now for the 2020 fair. Um, they still have them. And, and, they're, you know, and, and to be an official World's Fair, I mentioned this earlier, there's a the group called the Bureau of International Expositions. And you have to get their permission to be called an official World's Fair. This is what made Seattle's fair so interesting is they, you know, like we said, they were out there pitching this them, and it was a tough pitch because they didn't know where Seattle was. On top of that, they were going up against New York City, um, and yet Seattle won. Seattle got the official designation. New York had their own World's Fair two years later, but it wasn't an official World's Fair. So, and you know. So governments that participate in, in a fair that's an official fair, they're coming and they're not charged for their exhibit space and, and it's a diplomatic invitation that gets them there. If it's not an official World's Fair, governments can still uh, you know, send industrial exhibits, but it's not really the government participating. Yeah. It's, a f it's kind of a fine distinction, but when you start thinking your way through how that impacts sort of you know, the, the real um, nations getting along aspect of World's Fair, yeah. which was very important at our fair because everyone was terrified that somebody w was going to, you know, launch a nuclear warhead yeah. and blow the country to kingdom come. Um, so that idea of sharing space, uh, making peaceful use in countries, knowing p individually yeah. what the people in those countries were like was and, really And World's Fairs have shifted over the years. You know, you go back to the 1800s and what, what, what World's Fairs were used for then it was, were quite a bit different than what you see now. Now they're almost like glorified trade fairs. But some of the early fairs, a lot of cities would have them to, to show off their city. Yeah. Uh, and that's, the AYP was a prime example of that. They w the Northwest wanted to let the world know, hey, look at us. Look what we got here. We've got, we've got lumber industry. We've got a fishing industry. We've got, you know, all this great stuff. And, and hopefully if you come see the fair, maybe you'll end up moving here and buying land. And it's interesting because now, um, you know, for both the AYP and for Century 21, getting the federal government to participate was a really, really big deal. At the AYP, they left, like, the crowning spot on the on the fairgrounds for a government pavilion and then the government didn't come in until like a few months before the fair you can imagine how terrible that would have been and the government then sends like what you would go and see in the Smithsonian now all these aspects of American history all these artifacts that, s that show what it means to be an American what what we think is important enough to put in a museum so then for this fair the federal government comes in 
because this is going to be a science fair and a fair about the future and educating kids. And what they do is they build the United States Science Pavilion, which is now Pacific Science Center. Now. The federal government does not, our government does not participate in World's Fairs at all. Yeah. So they're not going to, we could, you could have one here and they wouldn't send an exhibit and they don't send official exhibits to other World's Fairs. If you see a the U.S. pavilion, it's going to be sponsored by Coca-Cola yeah. or somebody right. like that. Now I want to jump back on something Paula brought up about the, the whole Cold War aspect of the fair. I don't know if you saw recently. You know, it's interesting when you look at 1962 and here's this, this optimistic, bright, futuristic fair. You know, the future is going to be so cool. We're going to have monorails connecting all of our cities and they'll be under bubbles yeah. and flying cars and all that kind of stuff. All this at the same time when there's this huge threat of nuclear war going on. I don't know if you saw recently, but the Seattle City Council just posted online a copy of a letter that was uh, back in '62. There was a time capsule that was that was open to the fair, and they what they did was they had certain city departments write up letters to the future to the dear people of the to whoever year. would have their job. Yeah, would have years. their job. So, dear people of the dear people of 2012, and but the Seattle City Council just posted the one that was written by the Seattle City Council of 1962, and it said, you know, dear people of the future uh you know we hope everything is is going great we hope that that things have re are really as bright as we said at the fair of course at the same time we hope you're not a, a charred uh, pile of rubble uh, uh you know it, it, you know it, in, in these tr these turbulent times that we're living in in 1962 it just shows this dichotomy of the two and then that the bubble later that we showed earlier that was inside the exhibit in the Coliseum called the it was uh, the, called the World of Tomorrow was the, and, and it was a, a multimedia uh, show called the Threat and the Threshold. The threshold, of course, being we're at the threshold of a new era, and so you'd go up and it was all these different views of the future. Oh, we might have this, we might have that. One of those views was a family huddled in a in a fallout shelter. Uh, this may be one of our futures. It's interesting because something that almost never gets talked about, I mean, we talk about it in the book a little bit, but it certainly doesn't end up in documentaries, and it's not a sexy talking point when you're being interviewed by the newspaper, but there were several religious organizations that had pavilions. There was a Christian witness pavilion, and the guy who ran it, uh, a bunch of churches in El Paso, in El Paso, see, I, my brain is going crazy, I grew up in El Paso, in Seattle, <laughs> uh, you know, pooled together to put the money together to build this thing and he said we want to present an alternative uh, something that people could feel hopeful uh, it, since they have to live in this world under a threat of nuclear war yeah. so w different ways of coping with that tension in the world uh, addressed and at the fair and the, the whole aspect of the Cold War is what made the fair in the first place it, it took the launch of Sputnik in 1957 to turn the fair into a science-related fair, a future fair, because they didn't really have a hook up until then. Sputnik was launched, and those of you who are old enough to remember, that was scary. That was really scary when Sputnik launched, because here the Russians are beating us in the space race, for one, but now ooh, we know they have rockets that can go up into space. That means they have something they can drop down on us. So that shifted the focus of the fair to this science-related fair. So here now this optimistic fair, and then as Paula mentioned earlier, on the day the fair closed, Kennedy was supposed to come to the fair. He was supposed to be here to close the fair. A few days before that happened, they, they got a call from the White House saying, well, unfortunately, Kennedy's sick. He's got a cold, and he can't make it. Gee, that's too bad. So, the, well, okay, how about LBJ? Well, it turns out LBJ's sick, too. He can't come. So it wasn't until the day that after the fair, all of a sudden, people pick up the newspaper, and here they find that the Cuban Missile Crisis had been going on, probably the closest time the world has ever come to nuclear annihilation, on the day this, this fair ended. So you, it bookends both the beginning and end of the fair are, are, are Cold War related. Yeah, there's a lot of interesting things when you bump what was happening in exactly that time against what was happening at the fair. Um, you know, there's a couple of books about what exactly Kennedy's cabinet was doing during that week to try to cope with it before they announced it. And I was struck um, by the fact that the feminine mystique, which was such a game changer, you know, for, for women, um, that was actually in press during, during the fair. Like, so the, all of that, yeah. you know, uh, typical woman talk kind of uh, <laughs> <laughs> stuff, you know, it, it too was, you know, getting ready to crunch into a, a different ideology. Yeah. 
Kennedy only got to see the fair uh, grounds very briefly during construction. He was out for UW's uh, 50 or uh, 100th anniversary. And they, they drove him through the fairgrounds while he was here, just, just real quick. So he didn't get a chance. He wasn't here for the opening. I, we never figured out why he didn't come for the opening. The, the only thing we could think of is that it was Easter Sunday. And, um, yeah, they and were that was Palm, Easter weekend. Palm Springs. Yeah, and Palm he was Beach. in Palm Springs Palm. with his family. Uh, so he then wasn't here for the opening. Florida. And then he wasn't here for the ending. So. Yeah, I just wanted to know how many countries actually had pavilions, and I'm assuming that the Russians did not have a pavilion. No, they They're wanted them, actually. They, they, were, they were hoping, they actually asked uh, some of the communist nations to participate, and they did not get them to they, come. They really pursued um, Russia, the Soviet yeah. Union, very heavily. They, uh, Ewan Dingwall, who was the uh, vice president and general manager of the fair, actually went to Russia. He was there when Francis Gary Powers was shot That's down. Enough. And, he, you know, he, he wrote these uh, memos back to the office saying, oh, it's a little tense, but they're <laughs> still treating me fine. <laughs> um, there were 39, um, yeah. but some of the, of the pavilions had a lot of different countries in one, for example, the, the Afri African pavilion. The African pavilion was a collection of quite a few African nations there in was, one pavilion. There um, was uh, City of West Berlin uh, pavilion. I mean, the, the Berlin Wall, just very just recent. And, you know, World's Fairs give the, the public a chance to see what those countries send that tell the story of that country. And if you're having a hard thing going on, like Berlin, <laughs> you know, this is one way to get the, get the word out. Now, now, as far as Russia goes, there was one connection that, what, that did happen at the fair, and that was uh, Germán Titov, the cosmonaut. Uh, he visited the fair, and it was a real big deal. And, and this, it was actually pretty cool for people because the, the, the German, you know, they got to meet an actual, you know, someone who had been in space. And he was this l little guy, and you know, and he wandered around with his entourage. They were all taller than they would, so people hardly got a chance to see him because he was so small. But he got to wander the fairgrounds, and and the first day he did, the press was actually pretty positive. They were talking about, oh wow, this is really neat. You know, we have an actual astronaut, cosmonaut in our midst, mm -hmm. and you know, all this great stuff. Very positive press. Then he held a press conference, and so one of the reporters asked him if he if uh, he saw God in outer space, and he said, you know, basically said, no, I didn't. You know, I, you know, I believe in man. I don't believe in God. The press turned him turned on that like this. All of a sudden, now he's a godless commie, and uh, there, there was all this information. Oh, you're grinding their teeth, gnashing the teeth over this godless communist, you know, that was here visiting the fair. And it's funny to see the news articles from one day to the next. It's it's black and white. Right. So then John Glenn was here just a few days, few days after later, that, yeah. and naturally the press asked him. You know, if he had seen God in space, right? Is that a setup question? Because of course he knew all about the yeah. controversy, and he um, dodged it really cleverly. He said, "The God I worship is so large that I would not expect to find yes. him in outer space." <laughs> <laughs> Good one, John. <laughs> Actually, the, the crowds that that with uh, Glenn were larger than Elvis. I mean, it's it's another thing you have to put things into perspective and go back to that time. Um, when Glenn had just orbited the Earth, did his triple orbit of the Earth, uh, first you know man to do that, first American to do that American, actually, yeah. and this was huge. This is a huge American hero. We're now leading. We're now beating the Russians in the space race. So when he came here, it was a big, big deal, and the b crowds. He was staying at the Olympic Hotel, and people swarmed the hotel just to get a glimpse. Of, of John Glenn and his sh his ship, you know the Friendship Seven. There was a model of it displayed during the whole fair at the NASA Pavilion. But for one week, the actual ship was there, and they let people touch it, um, which is surprising. Now you know it's right inside the door at the uh, Museum of uh, Flight in the Smithsonian. But people would put their hands on it with tears running down their mm -hmm. cheeks because this object had been in space, and this American had done it. Um, you know, that's, yeah. that's one of those triumphant moments, I think, that we felt collectively as a nation and that people in Seattle at the fair were able to plug into. And that's yeah. not the only one. There are a lot of yeah. them. Um, Paula and Alan, we have a surprise for you. <gasps> Tony Gomez from KCTS9 is going to come out. He has something to show you. <laughs> Step to the rear <laughs> of the <laughs> Yay! Fantastic. This is a bub That's bubble a bubble elevator, elevator, elevator operator, operator uniform. Yes. 
<laughs> Yay! Yeah, it's gonna work. Let me feel That's there. great. Now this is a costume. Yeah. Yes, this, this is a costume. This is a costume. It looks just like it. We have um, Moha is going to have the real one in their permanent exhibit when they move to South Lake Union, and it's going to be fantastic. They're going to have a little Century 21 exhibit, and then we have one of the elevator operator at attendants, the elevator attendants, bubblator attendants uniforms in our exhibit. Our exhibit also has one of those red Union 76 the sky ride. ride. The sky we ride. have a car in there. It's yeah. hanging from the ceiling. It's yeah. so cool. Where's the bubble in now? Yeah, so what, uh, the, 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 we, this, this is the question we get asked all the time, actually, because people are very, you know, still remember the bubble layer. Of course, most people remember it from when it was in the center house, because after the fair, it was moved to the center house. It was there for years, and that's most people's memories are of it from there. Well, when they did a, the remodel of the center house, I believe in the 80s, um, they got rid. They, you know, they had no more use for it. So they thought, oh well, Children's Hospital will love this. The kids will love it. They love it. Well, Children's took it. You know, thanks. You know, what can what are they going to do with it? So they put it in storage. They just had it in storage. Well, there was a um, guy who worked for the PI. I think he was a copy editor. Um, Every year, he'd call, he'd contact children and say, "Hey, what's the latest on the on the on the bubble later? What are you doing with it? You know, oh, nothing yet. You know, he kept calling year after year. So finally, the the children's hospital, when he called one year, they said, "Listen, you're so interested in it. Do you want to buy it from us? You know, we'll sell it cheap. Sure." So he bought it. Well, he lives down in South uh, Federal Way down in Redondo, and he attached it to his home, and it's now a it's now a greenhouse on the side of his house. And if you're, if you're down that way, just, I mean, it's not that big of a community. Redondo is it. Just drive around the streets. You can't miss it. There it is. It's a big glass. I, I want to say that's the fair's rarest collectible. I mean, <laughs> there are some things that there are only a few of, like that the VIPs had, like certain license plates. But the bubbleator, yeah. only one, and he's got it. And, and just real quick, one other, one other structure that I think is hilarious that, 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 as far as reuse goes, Gracie Hansen's building still exists. It's down in Ravensdale, and it's their community center. <laughs> and it's called the Gracie Hansen Community Center down in, <laughs> down in Ravensdale. So now if you're down in Ravensdale, go check it out. Let's give a round of applause to Paula and Allen. And we, we could talk about this all yeah. night. <laughs> Th thank you guys for coming. This was really fun. Yeah, we love talking about this.